hearts to worship God. We'll be performing a piece this morning called In Remembrance by Jeffrey Ames. Uh, there, it's uh, mostly in English, but there are two little Latin lines, and they mean light eternal, uh, shine upon us, Lord. Uh, we'll be accompanied by Dr. Tanya Probst on the French horn as well.
I greet you in the name of the one who, though invisible, touches all people with a redeeming love through the cross of Calvary. It is his love that gives us pause to worship in spirit and in truth and to confess our shortcomings before his throne of amazing grace. And so I direct you now to the prayer of confession you will find printed for you in the order of service. Let us together pray. God of compassion, look upon us in mercy, for we have not walked in the way of Jesus, your Son. We have not laid down our lives for the gospel, but have sought to advance and defend ourselves. Our faith in you has wavered. We have trusted more in our own strength and understanding. In loving kindness, forgive us. Strengthen our faith by your Spirit that we would be courageous enough to embrace the way of the cross. Enable us to trust that this way of life, proclaimed and lived by Jesus, displays your glory more faithfully and profits us best both now and in ages to come. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. And as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us now turn and greet one another in the spirit of a loving Christ.
As we come to our time for prayer this morning, please be mindful of some of the following pastoral concerns. We want you to be aware that our staff member, Amy Flora's grandmother, has passed away, and the service celebrating her life will be in Shalot uh, tomorrow morning. Please remember the family <clears throat> of Clarence Gramley, who passed away. And while not a member of this church today, he has a history within this community and this congregation, as well as many friends here in Myrtle Beach. Also, Jackie Hurst on the death of her mother. We ask you to please remember Jim Butts, who had emergency surgery yesterday for an issue with his heart and is in Grand Strand Medical Center in the ICU this morning. We also celebrate the birth of Janice Cardell's granddaughter, born in Columbia, South Carolina on February the 8th. And we want you to also be aware that Pat Gibbons is now a grandfather. <clears throat> His granddaughter was born yesterday in Charleston. Pat called me at 6.30. A.M. <laughs> but I'm still glad she's here. In that spirit, let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, there are so many moments we are unsure about life and all that it involves. We often sing that you would enter every trembling heart and do your work of grace. Teach us this morning that while we ask you to enter our hearts, it's important that we strive to honor the place we already hold in yours. Your invitation sounds simple. Follow me. Yet as we try to follow, our selfish motives for life get in the way. Forgive us for those times when we do not want to decrease, that you can increase. We work hard to construct lives that satisfy our inner longings, and we are not a people who will surrender what we want very easily. As the words of a simple song testify, we have been fed to feed, and we are led to lead. Speak to our hearts this day, particularly through your servant, Dickie Knight, reminding us that the journey of faith is not from a spectator's chair, but from living and breathing your truth and becoming Christ for this world. Give to us strength to surrender all portions of our hearts to your care and keeping and to your leading, O God. Remind us once more that the invitation to true faith is an invitation to come and die to self and to place our confidence in the cross. For we pray this morning in the name of the one who gave himself on the cross that we might have life. And we pray in his name and as Jesus taught us saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We gather in this place to count our blessings one by one. There are many blessings that I would like to lift up this morning. Allow me to share these two. First, today is the day that churches across the land 
are recognizing the ministry of Girl Scouting, which builds girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. <clears throat> you might want to know that the first Girl Scout troop was organized on March 12, 1912, in Savannah, Georgia. The Girl Scouts of the United States of America was chartered by the United States Congress on March 16, 1950. Today, there are 3.2 million Girl Scouts, 2.3 million girl members, and 880,000 adult members working primarily as volunteers. Now, this is a special time of year, and if you have not yet received your Girl Scout cookies or ordered them, I am sure that if you will approach any Girl Scout, they can help you attain the cookies that you so desperately want and many of us need. In fact, I'm not going to say that Girl Scout cookies are important, but I understand there are a lot of people who actually give them up for Lent. That's eating, not buying. So if you are interested in finding uh, the joy that's in a Girl Scout cookie, seek out a Girl Scout today, and I'm sure that they will get them uh, to you as soon as possible. We're also blessed today to welcome Dickie Knight and his lovely wife Brenda to First Church of Myrtle Beach. Dickie serves as our district superintendent of the Marion District, and we are absolutely delighted that his schedule could, could accommodate his coming to us to preach for us. This is the initial time that he will preach for us. I'm sure in the next few years there will be other occasions and opportunities that he will do so, as well as leading us in our annual charge conference meetings that we hold here. Of these things of Dickie, I know. He is a servant of God. He has a wonderful heart, a good spirit, a warm handshake, and almost always a smile on his face. And that says a lot about the man on the inside, because what you see on the outside matches. And Dickie, we're absolutely thrilled and delighted that you're here, and we look forward to your message in just a bit. We are so blessed as a people. Let us continue our worship now with the giving of God's tithes and our offerings.
Thank you. Please be seated. We invite the children present to come forward to spend the next few moments with me. Good morning. I want you to put on your best listening ears because I've got a story to tell you and it goes back to when I was not much older than you a very long time ago. We played a game <clears throat> that was called Follow the Leader. Now some of the children at the first service this morning informed me that children are still playing that game even today. Follow the Leader. Wherever the leader would go, that's what we'd do. To the playground we'd go out there, if the leader climbed a tree, we climbed a tree. If, if the leader ran up the hill, we ran up the hill. If the leader fell down the hill, <coughs> then we all fell down the hill. We did what the leader would do, and we learned in that simple game that following is a good thing to do as long as the leader is good. But if the leader asks us to play in the street, no way. If the leader asks us to say bad words, no way. A good leader is somebody that you follow. A bad leader is someone that you leave behind. You don't listen to bad leadership. Jesus was a good leader in every way. He led people to love one another to always speak the truth, to forgive each other, and to not be so angry with each other that we are tempted to do bad things to other people. Yeah. Lent is a time when Christians, no matter how old we are or how young we are, make a decision to follow Jesus because Jesus is our leader. In fact, that's what church is really about. When we come to this place, we learn every Sunday how to follow Jesus. And if the Lord does it, then we ought to do it. Because Jesus is the very best leader that any of us will ever, ever know. So if you can grow up following Jesus... Things will be just a-okay. All right? Now let's bow your heads and please repeat after me as we pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, for his leadership, for the way he offers his hand to all of us, no matter how old, no matter how young. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Amen. Okay, off to little church.
today is from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33, on page 73 of your pew Bibles. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the, coming, the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. I'm going to walk with you. All right, I want to say something to start with. I am not giving up Girl Scout cookies for Lent. So if any of you are giving up Girl Scout cookies for Lent, I'm, you know, I'll welcome those cookies, okay? Is that good? All right, no, not, that's not the important thing. I am so glad to be here today. Uh, it's just wonderful uh, to be here at First United Methodist Church of Myrtle Beach. Uh, I am honored and uh, blessed to be serving as your district superintendent, and I appreciate so much uh, Ken and Jonathan and and Brandon and the entire staff here uh, at the church. Uh, they've always been so gracious and loving and welcoming and I appreciate you folks so much. And I appreciate you as members of this congregation. Uh, First United Methodist Church is indeed one of the great churches of the Marion District and I'm so proud of you and thankful for you. And again, I'm so honored and blessed to be your district superintendent. Thank you for giving this, me this very special opportunity to uh, proclaim the word today uh, uh, here at First Church. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for the privilege to share the good news today, Lord, to proclaim the gospel. And I pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will show us the way and that the words that we speak would be pleasing in your sight and that, would, and that they would bring glory and honor and praise to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> I want to ask you something. You don't have to raise your hand, nod your head, or anything like this, but how many of you enjoy crowds? How many of you enjoy crowds? Now, if you're a young person and have ever been to a concert by maybe one of your favorite artists, I know that you enjoy crowds because I've seen some of that. I don't go to them, but I've seen the young people just jumping up and down and clapping their hands and raising their hands and all of that. And I'm sure that that, um, you know, is stimulating and that young people enjoy that. They enjoy those kind of crowds. And I know some of you around Christmas time just enjoy those crowds at the mall, don't you? You get caught up in what everybody else is doing. And so you go to the mall and you do all your shopping and you enjoy being a part of the crowd doing your Christmas shopping. Now, what about sporting events? You know, some of you are, I know, I've been in most of the churches, or all the churches in the district, and in every United Methodist Church in the Marion District, there are avid Tiger fans. And guess what? There are avid Gamecocks fans as well, you know? And so I know that, and uh, if you've ever been to any of those big football games of either team, you enjoy that, don't you? You get, you know, you get really caught up in the excitement of the crowd. For the last two football seasons, my son and I have had a day together at one of those Gamecock games, okay, in Columbia. And about two years ago, we went to that one where the Gamecocks clobbered number one Alabama. Do you all remember that about two seasons ago? 
They clobbered them, okay? And it was so exciting and exciting and so stimulating to be a part of that crowd that day, you know, as the Gamecocks won that game. So crowds, you know, some people enjoy crowds. Others might just enjoy being at home alone and just enjoying um, being there. Well, you know, crowds, think about crowds. When Jesus came along and was carrying out his ministry, he attracted crowds all the time, didn't he? Crowds of people followed Jesus. And I, and I can imagine that most of those people followed him because of the miracles that he was performing, because of the healings that he was performing. You know, people go out for the spectacular. So, so people followed him. Crowds followed him because they wanted to see what Jesus would do next. Some of them followed him to hear him teach. But crowds followed him. Some of the crowds pressed upon him. They pushed themselves upon him. Some of the crowds praised Jesus. You and I are on this journey of Lent, you know. We're, we're, we're on this journey toward the cross and the empty tomb. On that Sunday, before Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world, Jesus entered Jerusalem, remember? And you remember the crowds gathered, and they welcomed Jesus. And they shouted, and they, and they cried, and they, and they yelled, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. Blessed, Hosanna to the one, to the son of David. Now, as we think about that crowd, and as we think about crowds today, especially at football games, crowds can become fickle very quickly. Now, I don't know how many of you were looking at any of the foot, uh, NFL football playoff games, but I, I, I didn't look at all of them. But I remember one of those games as I was looking at it, the home team was not doing very well. And it didn't take long for the home, home crowd to start doing things like boo, boo, you know. I mean, they were, you know, doing that against their own team. So crowds can become fickle. Even hometown crowds can act like that. Well, there was that crowd on Palm Sunday, you know, before Good Friday, who welcomed Jesus. You know, they praised Jesus. They were so glad that King Jesus had come to town. But many people who were part of that crowd on Friday were shouting these words, crucify him, crucify him. That crowd had become fickle rather quickly. I want you to think about it today. It's really easy to be part of the crowd. It's easy to come to church on Sunday morning where there are three or four hundred Christians that we're worshiping with. You know, that's, that's kind of easy, isn't it? And it's great that you're here. You know, God wants us to come together as Christians. But that's the easy part. It's more difficult when we leave this sanctuary and live our lives day by day as disciples of Jesus Christ at school, at work, or wherever we go. It's not quite as easy to live as a Christian to live as a disciple. When it comes to following Christ, it's easy to be a Christian among all the other Christians, but it's a whole different ball game to live as a disciple of Christ. Now, I believe, personally, that there's a difference between being a Christian and being a disciple of Jesus. And the question I want each one of us to ask ourselves this morning is this, am I a disciple? Or am I a Christian in the crowd? And I want to share something right off the bat this morning. When we relate to Jesus as disciple to master, it should be the most intimate personal relationship that we can have with our Lord. Is that the kind of relationship that you desire? Is it the kind of relationship that I desire? In the scripture that was so beautifully read just now, Jesus called those in the crowd that day to become disciples. Listen to the beginning of the text uh, once again. Large crowds were traveling with him, and, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his or her own life, they cannot be my disciple." 
What a challenging invitation to Christian discipleship. Back in 1948, a young man from Charlotte, North Carolina, began preaching the gospel. You know, he began, you know, attracting crowds of people before too long. And he continued to preach and preach and preach for over half a century. He slowed down some now. As a matter of fact, I, I think he slowed down completely because his son Franklin Graham has taken, pretty much taken over. But Billy Graham was faithful in proclaiming God's word from 1948 until, until just a few years ago. Billy Graham has written a lot of books. He said a lot of wonderful things, you know, throughout his career uh, as an evangelist. But, and th there's one quotation from Billy Graham that I want to share with you today, which I think is so important. Maybe one of the most important things that Billy Graham has ever said, and, and I don't know whether anybody's ever heard it that much, but J Billy Graham has said these words, salvation is free. Salvation is free, but discipleship cost everything we have. Think about that. Think of Billy, Billy Graham's words are true. You can be saved. You can accept Jesus as your Savior. You can be saved and have the assurance of going to heaven and still not be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Indeed, being a disciple will cost. We have a, there's a price to pay if we're going to be a disciple of our Savior. Listen to Jesus' words first. He says that, that you and I must, be, must hate father, mother, wife, ch children, brothers, and sisters, and even our own lives, or else we cannot be his disciples. Now, that, that sounds like a radical teaching, and it is. It sounds even harsh, especially if we take that word hate in the literal sense of the word, and as we use it a lot of times today. I don't believe Jesus is saying that we should hate these special pe people in our lives. Hate in the context of Scripture simply means to love less. Jesus is saying that loving him must be our number one priority. We cannot love anyone or anything more than we love Jesus and be his disciple. Jesus must be our first love. It's so easy to, 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 to get our priorities all messed up and to put so many things and, and to put even people before we put Jesus in our lives. You know, think about that rich young ruler that came to Jesus and, you know, he wanted to know what it would take to have eternal life. And, you know, Jesus really wanted him to, to be one of his followers, to be one of his disciples. And Jesus said to him, well, you know, you've got to do one thing. You've got to be willing to sell everything you have. You know, sell everything you have and give it all to the poor. And then come and follow me. You've got to be willing to make a sacrifice. You've got to be willing to give up something. Mark tells us in his gospel that that man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. His wealth was more important than following Jesus as a disciple. So many things can replace Jesus as our first love and our top priority. Family and friends, our career, material possessions, money, and even sports. But I say again, I say again, we cannot love anyone or anything more than we love Jesus and be his disciple. It's not a, it's not a question of hating anybody. It's a question of loving Jesus first and foremost. In the book, My Utmost for His Highest, Oswald Chambers writes a devotional called His, H-I-S with an exclamation point. It's expounding on Luke 14, 26. Chambers says these words. Any one of the relationships our Lord mentions in this verse can compete with our relationship with Him. I may prefer to belong to my mother or to my wife or to myself, but if that is the case, then Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple. This does not mean that I will not be saved, but it does mean that I cannot be entirely his. Entirely his. 
Being Jesus' disciple means that you and I must be entirely His. General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, when asked about the secret of his amazing Christian life, responded with these words, I told the Lord that he could have all that there is of William Booth. Entirely his. I'm sure that was General Booth's motto. Entirely his. Can you and I say that today? You know, we are taking this Lenten journey. And I, I wonder, I, and, I, and this is a challenge to you today. I wonder if you and I could start praying each day. Lord Jesus, I really want to be entirely yours. I want to be entirely yours. Not just during this Lenten season, but for the rest of my life. Entirely his. Jesus says that there's something else involved in being a disciple he says that, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. In a related passage from Matthew 16, 24 and 25, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. Now what's Jesus saying? He's saying that being a disciple will mean some sacrificing. The early disciples of Jesus certainly discovered this to be true. Many of them followed Jesus to torturous deaths. John Fox, in his book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, gives us some information based on tradition and based on fact. Here are some of the things that he says about how those disciples of Christ died. Peter was crucified upside down testifying that he was unworthy to die as his Lord was. James, the son of Zebedee, was put to death with a sword by King Herod, and Matthew was put to death by sword in Ethiopia. James, the brother of Jesus, was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple to the ground a hundred feet below. When he, sur when he survived, his executioners finished the job with a fuller's club. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, was flayed to death by a whip in Armenia. Andrew, Peter's brother, died on an X-shaped cross in Petros, Greece, as he testified, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. It took Andrew two days to die, and all that time he shared the gospel with his executioners. Thomas was speared to death in India. Paul was tortured and beheaded in Rome in A.D. 67 by Nero, and Matthias, who took the place of Judas Iscariot, was stoned and beheaded. Like Jesus, many of his disciples then and since then have suffered persecution and paid the price with the confidence that in losing their life for the sake of Jesus, they would gain it for all eternity. That is good news for disciples in 2012 as well. Have you ever heard uh, the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer? I'm sure that most of you have, many of you have. He was a German theologian who lived during the first half of the 20th century. His greatest work was one called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, he made this statement, and it's not politically correct, okay? But he says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed by hanging on April 9, 1945, at the age of 39. He had bravely resisted Hitler's Nazi regime, unlike many of the other German clergy. On a radio broadcast in Berlin, he rebuked the German church. Standing up as one of Christ's disciples, Bonhoeffer said, There can only be one Fuhrer or leader for Christians and it isn't Adolf Hitler. The radio program was brought to a sudden halt, a foreboding prologue of things to come. Bonhoeffer was willing to lose his life for Jesus' sake, and he gained eternity for it. You and I may not 
die, and we probably won't have to die as we stand up for Jesus. You know, there's a, uh, I don't know whether how many of you have been listening to uh, any of the news programs this week and the last week or two, but there's been some news about an Iranian Christian pastor, have you heard about that, who is scheduled to be executed. He has been converted. He was converted, I think, years ago from Islam uh, to Christianity, and he is a pastor. He has a wife and a couple of children. They've been showing his picture on television. You know, our president and a lot of the leaders of the world have have, are talking about and saying how inhumane that would be, you know, to persecute somebody, to execute somebody for their faith, even if they don't go along with all the other people in their country. So here we have a, a man right now who might be facing, you know, death for his, uh, for his faith in Christ. And you and I may not have to die for our faith, as I said just now, but, but carrying our cross means standing up for Jesus in a post-Christian materialistic society that will often ridicule us for our morals and our faith in Christ. Just go out there in the secular world and take a stand for Jesus. You know, take a stand for Jesus. Take a stand for morality, and you'd better believe that you will probably be ridiculed and mocked. You know, you may not be tortured, you may not be killed, but you will be looked upon as foolish in the sight of the world. You know, you and I will never go through any kind of ridicule or torture like Jesus went through. As he, as he hung there on the cross of Calvary, Jesus took a lot. You know, the people ridiculed him. The rulers sneered at him. You know, the soldiers cried out, he saved others, let him save himself if he's the son of God, the one that, the chosen one. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself, they shouted. Those who carry their cross today can expect to be ridiculed and mocked and made fun of and taunted again as foolish by the secular world. Warren Wearsby, an American pastor, Bible teacher, uh, co conference speaker, and prolific writer of Christian literature, met a lady one time who said to him that her asthma was her cross. She said to him that her asthma was the cross that she was bearing, and, and Warren Wearsby says, that's not what Jesus had in mind. He says, to take up the cross means to identify with Christ in his rejection, shame, suffering, and death. Now, are you, am I willing to do that? Cross-bearing might get tough, but you and I have a lot of promises in God's Word. Promises like, hey, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Hey, greater is the one who's in you than the one who's in the world. And you and I have that promise that when we live as disciples of Jesus Christ, we can be more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave his life for us. After using a couple illustrations about counting the cost of discipleship, about a builder constructing a tower and a king going to war, Jesus sums up everything in verse 33 when he says, In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Billy Graham is absolutely right. Salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything. Do you and I today love Jesus personally and intimately? Do we have a, a love for Jesus that, that goes far beyond any of our closest relationships here on earth? Are we satisfied with being a Christian in the crowd? Or are we willing to pay the price of being a disciple? What's it going to be as we continue this journey toward the cross of Calvary and remember all that Jesus did for us there? Jesus is reaching out his arms always, and he's saying to us as Christians, 
Are you going to be a disciple? Are you going to be satisfied with being a Christian in the crowd? What's it going to be for you? What's it going to be for me? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My friends, as disciples of Jesus Christ, I invite you now to stand as we speak words that affirm our faith, words that generations in the past have spoken and generations yet to be will speak as we affirm our faith, the faith of the apostles. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before we sing together the benediction response, go forth now with these words. Live as those who give all you have for the one who gave us all he had. Amen. Amen.